Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to this career panel, finding the right postdoc as an engineering PhD. And so I want to get to our conversation. And so I don't want to bog you down with a little bit with this information, but I want to give you a framework as to what we're working with so that you understand the conversation a little bit better. So what is a postdoctoral scholar? A postdoctoral scholar is someone who conducts research after completing their doctoral studies, typically a PhD. Postdocs usually work under the supervision of a PI, a principal investigator, and are often involved in advanced research projects to gain further expertise in the field. And postdoc, postdoc positions are usually temporary. They can be found in various settings like universities, research institutions, industry, governmental labs, and nonprofit. And within these positions, you develop crucial skills, publish your findings to strengthen your resume, and you prepare individual, and this prepares individuals for more permanent jobs in the industry or in academia. There are four main, there are different types of postdocs, but these are the categories that they land in. The first one is academic. Quick question, are you sharing the screen? Am I sharing the screen? I don't think you are. I'm not sharing the screen. Go oh, darn it, heck. Sorry, uh, you were sharing the screen. Yeah. Oh, you were sharing the screen. I was also seeing the screen. Okay. There we go. Is it there? Are we good? It's about, so, yeah. Yes, good. Awesome. Okay. The types of postdocs, we have to start with academic. Everyone knows about the academics. It could be in either research or teaching. Uh, research positions involve more work under a PI and are common at research universities. Teaching postdocs involve a significant amount of teaching, and they're often referred to as visiting assistant professors, professorships. In the industry, postdocs are available in different industries, including pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, tech companies. And they focus on applied research and development, often with the potential transition to permanent roles. Next is the government and national labs. Postdocs in government and national labs or national research facilities focus on research projects that align with national priorities. And these positions can provide unique opportunities to work on large scale and impactful projects. And lastly, nonprofit and think tank postdocs. These positions are similar to academic postdocs but are based in nonprofit organizations or think tanks, and they often involve uh, policy research, advocacy, and public engagement. So just to give you a, an overview. So we're going to start with our panel. I'm so happy that they're here. Um, they have a breadth of experience to share with us. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to popcorn someone, and we'll go from there. Now, let's see. Let's go with... Dr. Razavi, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background, and what you're doing right now? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me. So my background is in biomedical engineering. I did my PhD in biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins. And I was basically uh, mainly working in the cell biology department uh, on the Johns Hopkins medical campus. So my research was more on the intersection of uh, engineering and biology, uh, and I'm interested in a field called synthetic biology, how we can use different uh, biomolecules such as protein, DNA, RNA to make devices that we can deploy in our body. So after I finished my PhD in Dr. Takanari Inoue's lab, working in the cell biology department, I transitioned to MIT, the biological engineering department. Actually, MIT is one of the schools that has been pioneering the synthetic biology work. And if I say my PhD was more focused on protein level devices, during my postdoc, I'm working on RNA level devices for both diagnostics and therapeutics purposes. Next up. Can I say, please, Dr. Biswas? Sure. Yeah, thank you for having me. So I have a background of electrical engineering from India. And I came to join Hopkins in electrical engineering department. But my work was focused on computational cell biology. So I have a, like a hard transition from electrical engineering to understanding the cell biology. And during PhD, my research was focused on understanding how different um, signaling molecule uh, interact within a cell and how that drives the cell to uh, move toward uh, something called the chemical cues. 
So I tried, to, so I collaborated with a bunch of experimental cell biologists from uh, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. So based on their experiment, I tried to build up a model so that we could have a better explanation of how the cell moves. And after completing my PhD, I changed my research direction to understand how that cell movement, uh, like whatever the knowledge uh, we use, like the control system, uh, mathematical theory, that could be applicable to understanding how the animal moves and how different animal movement get shaped by the available sensory information. So right now I am um, doing a postdoc with Professor Noah Cowan uh, in the LCSR to like keep understanding how these like wonderful animals uh, move. Uh, so that's yeah. Thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Grunewald. Thank you. So I got my PhD in chemistry and um, my graduate work, work was actually focused on synthetic chemistry. But then after an internship with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, I shifted towards nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And so I picked up a postdoc with Sandia National Labs where I'm focusing on um, NMR spectroscopy, characterization of electrochemical systems, and uh, for material science purposes. Uh, and we uh, recently just started on a project where we will be analyzing uh, with our NMR methods, uh, space-flown batteries from the Polaris Dawn mission. So we have some very accomplished people here, and it's really exciting to get into what you've experienced, especially being in a postdoc. and the different directions you're planning on going. And it's really interesting how we all have talked about basically switching from one type of one type of subject to another and being successful in this. And so my first question to everyone and whoever would like to answer, why did you pursue? Oh, sorry. Why did you decide to pursue a post? I can go ahead and take that one. So for me, it was, I used it as an opportunity to switch fields. And I would encourage anyone looking to explore maybe a branch of something outside of their graduate work to pursue a postdoc because it gives you that time for kind of some freedom to explore different opportunities. And it's also the point of peak productivity. So you leave your PhD as a capable scientist. And this gives you time to establish yourself in a field without having the extra uh, responsibilities of being in a full-time staff position, all the paperwork and everything. You could use it as either a opportunity to shift into something new or even to just establish yourself in your field before picking up extra responsibilities. Dr. Um, one? Yeah, I can go next. Uh so my case is a little different. So generally people like if someone is done from Institute E, their PhD, they generally move to a, a different institute to do the postdoc. But in my case, I remained in the Johns Hopkins. One of the reasons was that I was deeply motivated by Professor Common's research. And to be honest, when I joined the PhD, I got the exposure to two labs. One was my PhD PI's lab and my postdoc PI's lab. So I made up my decision that once I finish my PhD, I'm going to explore the field, which is now my the research direction. And I did a rotation project uh, with my postdoc PI during my first year. So I already knew what will be the research direction would be and how that lab works. So I was al already familiar with uh, the atmosphere. So that's helped me to choose that rather than going out to some other institutes, so other PI, which I probably only have known from the literature that has been published. So I feel that not only like knowing the PIs, but also knowing the peers that I'll be working with also gave me the confidence to choose the postdoc and like um, being in the Hopkins. Thank you. Yeah, and if I want to tell you about my motivation and why I did a postdoc, the short answer is because I was interested in the academic career. And one thing is once uh, trying to apply for academic jobs, the main thing they ask for is basically 
uh, your research flowers once you open your own lab. And as a PhD student, with the knowledge and the technical expertise, you end up proposing something that is very similar to the PhD lab. But doing a postdoc will give you the opportunity to either learn a new technique, address a different type of science, or work with a different like model organism to learn something new in order to be able to forge a career path that has a blend of your PhD work and postdoc work. So you can basically propose something new that is not necessarily aligned with either your uh, PhD or your postdoc lab. Right, great. So a lot of folks get into postdocs, as some of the panelists have mentioned, because they're considering going the academic route uh, as a professor. For those on the panel, did you initially plan to do the postdoc because you wanted to leverage that for an academic career? Is that still your plan? And do you think it is needed to be a research professor? I'm going to start, I'm going to start picking people. Okay. I can give, try to give an answer. Okay. So first thing, I don't believe that after PhD or postdoc, the only options are going to the academy or going to the industry. So now there are a lot more opening. So for example, like editor for science or nature, this is a full-time job. And if I'm not mistaken, Roshni Rao, which has a, like a really impactful person. So she had her postdoc. Then she chose to come into this professional development and doing a great job in Hopkins. So coming to the point about academic, please begin your question. Yeah. So did you choose to do the postdoc to leverage it into an academic position? If so, is that still your plan? And do you generally think it is necessary if you want to be a professor? Uh, so nowadays it's very competitive field. So as Shiba mentioned that we need to have a research statement, which is not in the same state following our PhD or the postdoc PI has to have an independent statement. So which uh, requires time as well as we need to build a resume, like more number of paper citations. So the postdoc period gives us that grace period. So it's like a limbo stage, but we are preparing for our next stage, whether it's academia, and nowadays, I think people, when they recruit, they like to see if someone has the postdoc experience, which was not the regular case in 90, but I would say now it's become mandatory. And it's not easy to get faculty position in a top-notch university without having a postdoc. Even someone has a really great profile in the PhD, because some of the papers get in the pipeline, so like an archive or in the preview process. So we need time to get that published. So postdoc also keep us that. So in some sense, I would say it's a manager. Did any of y'all, any of, of y'all go for this as a, you, Dr. Rizali, you, you were talking about going into the academic field. That's right. Yeah. So I decided to do a postdoc because of being interested in academia, but to also just pivot upon what Dr. Biswas was saying is that it's true that as a postdoc, you can learn something new in order to be able to propose a research program that is unique as, a, as an academician. But the other thing is that I've um, had uh, friends or colleagues who were superstar during their PhDs, published really good papers, extremely productive. And then once they applied directly for a faculty position, they were told, what if you just got lucky? Or what if a lot of the, the ideas is coming from your PhD advisor? So they were even told, do a short post, like one or two years, so you can show productivity in another context. So uh, uh, despite the fact that historically, especially in the engineering disciplines, as a PhD student, you could directly go to the uh, academic job market, I feel these days, in either the interdisciplinary engineering biology uh, disciplines or even in pure engineering disciplines such as electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, it seems more and more that post is experience is required even for an academic position. I would agree with both of the other two on this. My goal was to never go into academia, but I think it's pretty competitive to get into that route. And even now in the last national lab system, 
it's pretty common that postdoc comes first and then later will be your full-time staff role. Makes sense. And so just going off of the idea that postdocs were, are originally meant to go into academia, right? That's what the, that's what everybody pretty much understands. Do you think that there is utility for a postdoc for those who don't want to go into academia from your, pers- from your perspective? Definitely. For the national labs as well, it's becoming more common to do the postdoc first. I believe it's time to really establish yourself in, as an independent researcher now that you are at a point of kind of uh, peak productivity, but also with the competitive job market, even in the national labs, it's pretty common now that you start as a postdoc and then move into your state position. Yeah, and just to basically pivot on what Heino mentioned is that it is true that right now a lot of positions in the industry, in, even like outside of academia, they ask for this postdoc training. But one reason for that is that a lot of people do postdocs to get into academia. And generally, there is a, 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 like very few openings in academia. So you end up with a lot of postdocs on the job market that do have that postdoc training, that additional experience. And if PhD students are competing with postdocs or those non-academic jobs, generally the postdocs who have more experience are going to be prioritized for the most part. So I see this trend that more and more in biotech in different sectors within this industry, they're now asking for postdoc experience. And I can't say I'm so happy about it because I know, for example, friends from Hopkins who did a PhD, they knew they want to go work for a biotech. They could enter as a postdoc scientist, as opposed to the more senior scientist. And generally they can pay you less as a postdoc because we're still in the training. So that is not necessarily to our benefit, but that's how the market is right now. Yeah. That makes, um, that makes sense. Yeah. Go ahead. As you mentioned in the slide that there are several postdoc options. So one can do actually do the postdoc under the industry. For example, big biotech like Janssen, Takeda, they have the postdoc position. So it's like their scheme to pay less, but getting probably the same amount of work done by a scientist, like the scientist's own position. And if one get one get the position in the postdoc of the industry, probably that would be helpful for him or her to get the promotion to the scientist one. And if someone is doing, suppose, so my field was the modeling, computational cell biology. But if I have to go to the biotech, I do not have a direct experience of doing something called the PKPD modeling or like the pharma modeling. So I might choose to go to do a postdoc where the postdoc research direction is like directly aligned to the research direction that these pharma companies want. So in that case, I would say, yeah, it's going to be helpful to get a job. And probably in that case, the, the connection of my postdoc PI might help to get a job. And no one can deny the, how much effective the connection are to get a job. And uh, some of the cases, they have a sponsored postdoc. For example, like Satara, they have a sponsored postdoc to, say, University of Florida. So it's like working in academia, but is a con- having a connection to the industry. So in those cases, this kind of postdoc really helps. And when you actually look at the job application criteria, they like plus person experience, like one or two years of experience. So in some cases, these postdoc experiences can be treated as those experiences. So even if someone doesn't have the industry experience, but has a postdoc experience in a similar field, that kind of leverage the, like help the profile of that uh, candidate. To get a job. Wonderful. So given that the title of this event is finding the right postdoc is the start of the title, right? Putting the question on y'all, how did you find your postdoc? And were there other places that you were considering before you ended up where you eventually ended up? I mean, if I go, I have to say, I went to research conferences in fields that it was of interest to me. And I talked to different PhD students or postdocs who were presenting posters and basically tried to learn more about different labs or projects. And basically I applied for the lab I applied for because 
I thought I liked the mentoring side of the PI. And of course, you know, the foremost thing is the research. I was interested in research and I just basically had like a handful of labs that I was interested in. I sent out an email to them with a cover letter and I heard back from some of them and I didn't hear back from uh, others. So I had a mix of both types of responses. Uh, for me, I was um, only interested in the national labs. Um, I did a graduate internship with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory um, uh, during my PhD and found that uh, there was a nice blend of uh, freedom to do your own research, but uh, also less burden of finding funding and, and less of a publisher parish kind of atmosphere as there is in academia. And so I knew that I wanted to be in the national labs. So I spent a lot of time on the National Lab websites and also using connections that I had already built during my internship. So as I mentioned, then my case was different. So I knew that I'm going to do the postdoc with Professor Gowen from the very first. But in general, what Shiva and Hannah mentioned that the connection plays a very important role. So it's not just like the BI, the research, but also the peers to know the atmosphere of the lab, which plays a really crucial role for successful. Yeah, I'd say that research conferences are a good place to uh, know about the research, to know about your peer and the PI, good and bad thing. And also I'd say the LinkedIn could play a very important role, like uh, reaching out to the people which you might, which you like make the connection first to the LinkedIn and then get to know in person when we attend conferences. And one thing about the postdoc that I forgot to mention to a previous question is that for an international student, if someone wants to already have a plan to go to the industry, we have something, a very restrictive thing, which is called a visa. So we only get one plus two year extension on the scene. And it happens that once we get those uh, possibility of extension exhausted, then the company that going to recruit the person only had the option of go for the O1, which requires a good amount of money because they have to pay the lawyer. So if already someone or made up his or her mind to go to the industry, then I would say not to exhaust the whole three year doing the postdoc, but like looking for the job, maybe just doing six months or one year of postdoc so that you have some time to get that industrial H1B, which is a lottery system. So yeah, just for the international student, it's a kind of like concern we have to keep. That's super valuable. Thank you. I, I appreciate all of your viewpoints. And looking into how you found your post off, we've already talked about its benefits, but I want to go deeper with the benefits. So what are the benefits of doing a postdoc and what are the potential drawbacks that were that you're experiencing? Okay, I got So there's a little difference between doing a PhD and the postdoc. So PhD, we have to do a lot of postwork. I think all of us have the experience of investing our time doing the homework and like balancing between doing the homework and the coursework and the doing the research. During the postdoc, we have the opportunity to involve more into the research and also getting more responsibility like writing grant. What Shiva mentioned that if someone wants to go to the academia, he or she needs to have a research day. So like getting used to how this grant writing works. So doing the postdoc also gives the opportunity to get involved in those processes. Also, I'd say that pretty much depends on the PI, like how much they want to share that burden with you. Because it's not a burden, actually. It's like a learning process. So in that case, I'd say these are the important thing which kind of make a difference between a PhD and postdoc because since we are all like looking forward to our next step with this grand writing and, and uh, all those like the statement, like ethics, teaching statement. So we need to learn how to get prepared for those. So the postdoc kinds of provide that opportunity. So one of the drawback is that I personally feel about the, what you mentioned is a temporary. So. I'm not an administration person, so maybe like you can, if I say something wrong, just rectify me. And so if, if there'd be a funding issue, probably the in, 
the university has some kind of discretionary grant to fund that. For a postdoc, it's very much dependent on the ability of the fund. So if somehow something does not work, like the PI's grant did not get renewed, so then probably we would not have any other sources to get supported, right? Unless one has own grant like the K99 or any other fellowship option. So in that case, it's a little bit more uncertain. And also for the international student, there comes the issues of H-1B application, right? Other factors like getting the visa stamp and not getting the visa approval. So yeah. So those concerns are there, which is less in the PhD, but is there. But life is like there. So basically the funding is definitely super important when it comes to this. Yes, yeah, so just I was just gonna say, yeah, Shiva. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so just I actually totally I agree with the majority. And I have to say the post doc experience is really exciting because you can it's a very basically creative phase. You could totally focus on research. You are free from all of the benchmarks you have to meet as a PhD student oral exam thesis committee meeting. So you can put most of your efforts into your research grant writing that is also a learning experience if you want to apply for academic positions. But I have to agree once it comes to the caveats, one is that as a PhD student, you're hired by a department. If there's a lack of funding, if there is any issue, the department supports you. But as a post you are hired by a professor. And if the grant is a scarce, you're basically just have to sort it out uh, either yourself or through your PI. And then the other thing that I have to say, it could be a little bit more exclusive to the Boston area in red. There are a lot of biotech companies or tech companies around in Boston, and they pay really well. So postdocs are competing in the housing markets with employees who are getting paid really well. So that aspect of it, our salary does not, it, it faces the marginal change with respect to the PhD lifestyle. But I feel in terms of the quality of life that I had in Baltimore was better than, than what I have in Boston once it comes to finances. From a national lab standpoint, the issue of funding is less so of an issue. There are certain groups where you're still applying for funding, but you sign more of a contract. And in my experience and in other postdoc experiences, at least at Sandia, you're pretty supported during your time. It's usually at Sandia, it's a three-year contract. The one negative though, is that it is still a temporary position. And so towards the end of it, it's not that you're settling into your research and really going deep into it. Eventually you are having to look for a full-time position. And depending on the funding in the lab as a whole, there may not be availability for a full-time staff position at the lab. You may have less issues with funding throughout your uh, postdoc, but eventually there's the limbo of looking for a full-time position. Um, wonderful. So one of the potential downsides you sometimes hear about more so just staying in the academic environment is work-life balance, right? Not a lot of us have great work-life balance as PhD students. A lot of us are concerned about that when we enter a postdoc. So how is your work-life balance as a postdoc? And specifically, is it better or worse or like different than when you were a PhD student? At Sandia and I believe at the other national labs, the culture here is is pretty great. And individuals' work-life balance is really important to everyone in the labs. And so people here work really hard uh, while we're at work, um, but also have our hobbies outside. And so I would say that, uh, at least for me, my postdoc experience has been uh, more of a work-life balance. Yeah, for me, I had been doing more experimental work as a PhD student and it has stayed the same as a postdoc. So in terms of work-life balance, I can't say it has improved or the opposite. And generally, we are not required to put a certain number of hours in the lab. It's very much driven by the result. If I can get lucky and get a certain result in two days, I want to stay at home for the next five days of the week, that's fine. But usually we don't get that lucky for it to happen. It's always the opposite. So it's just, you have to come to the lab, 
take care of yourselves that are living, do not understand the concept of a weekend. And just, uh, so I think the work-life balance, I would say in experimental biology is always dictated by the, basically the timeline of whatever you're working with in the lab, which could be a living organism. Yeah, so the work-life balance. So I say it's very much dependent on the project that I'm working on, or like anybody is working on, and also the BI. And sometimes it's like a critical time, like a grant renewal, then I won't say that there would be a good work-life balance, like more work and uh, less life. But overall, I see that the things I mentioned that no coursework, no headache office, physics committee meeting. Since we get to invest more time in the research and if we're enjoying the research, which is makes a pleasant experience. And also the poster of being a senior, we have the authority, I would say, but have the advantage of delegation. So in that sense, we might have someone assisting like an undergrad or a junior graduate student. So we might not always have to the work by ourselves because the mentorship is also something we need to learn. So how to, if someone is going to academia or industry, it's always good to have a good experience or skill set, how to mentor people. So in that sense, the work get divided between me and my mentee. I'd say, yeah, so there's a uh, good chance of having the work-life balance. Awesome. Like, basically what I'm hearing is it just depends on the environment you're in, right? Depends on where you're at, how, what the culture is, and if you're working with or living organisms or not, right? That makes sense. So going into how did things differ in your, as a grad student compared to your postdoc when it comes to your responsibilities? So it's, again, depends on the lab culture. So in some of the cases that when we are PhD, we are only responsible for our project, like one single project. But sometimes the postdoc has to do their own project as well as being, say, teaching experiments to a new grad student. In that case, I'd say there comes the teaching responsibility, the mentoring responsibility. In that sense, I'd say it's different. For me, it's felt like kind of a transition into a role with the most responsibility. And I have more responsibilities than I did in my PhD. I help look for funding and apply for grants. And I, it's expected that I take on uh, more lead than I did during my PhD and do most of my own independent thinking. But it's still not quite as much as, say, my mentor is doing. And in the end, while it's uh, helpful that I'm if I participate in finding funding, it's not a requirement of my job. Yeah, also, I don't have so much to add. I completely agree with Hannah and Dewajoti. It's just a foray into independence and there's more responsibility and just like a good practice to test how it feels to become fully independent. You've all touched on this a little bit throughout these questions, but getting more specific, what are the things that you enjoy about your postdoc and that make you happy that you chose to do this postdoc? My postdoc has been pretty cool in that I've had the opportunity to uh, matrix across different groups at Sandia. Uh, so postdocs are notoriously cheap. Different groups are always excited to have postdocs come in and support their roles. I work in the material science division, but I've also matrixed with the global security division and traveled to Kenya and taught their institutional professionals about global security. And as a full-time staff that has a lot more overhead and costs a lot more, I wouldn't have the opportunity to matrix into kind of other roles and explore other career options. And I have to say for me, it's definitely like the excitement of the science itself. And also in order to be able to collaborate so freely, I feel as a PhD student, sometimes you are tethered to the lab because of either, or like to the campus because of coursework, because of meetings, like committee meetings you have to attend. But because uh, the postdoc experience is more research focused, 
uh, everything is driven by that research. And I, I'm truly enjoying the collaborations with people from other fields that we have ongoing. So that's one of the most exciting parts for me. Yeah, I can agree with Shiva. So the science itself is a very exciting and which is the driving force for me to continue the postdoc. And also I get more responsibility in terms of like collaborating directly as well as helping my PI to write the grant. So this kind of like a new experience, which was like, I did not get a chance to during my PhD. All right, everyone, I am encouraging if you have questions. We're not done yet. I have one more question. But if you have questions from what we've been talking about, put it in the chat. So one of our last questions is, what are some tips for looking for postdocs that you would recommend to our current graduate students? Uh, something that surprised me when I was looking for my postdoc is just the amount of applications that I had to put out there. And so I would say don't get discouraged if you're having to apply to tens of positions. And also don't be afraid to apply for those for each positions with something maybe you only meet half of the qualifications. You have no idea what a job panel will find uh, interesting about your specific background. I'd say the role I'm in right now was a bit of a reach because I was transitioning fields a little bit. But it's definitely possible. And if there's something you're excited about learning more about, definitely go for it. Yeah, and if I were to just highlight two points, one is I think it's a good time to apply for postdoc positions. Postdocs are in high demand, especially in academia, especially in our sector. I feel a lot of people go for uh, working in biotech companies. So a lot of uh, professors are looking for postdocs. And it's very different than 10 years ago that it was like harder to be in the market. And then the second thing was we hear the theory of how you have to write a good cover letter, a good email, but it's really important to write your cover letter in advance, give it to multiple people to read it. And I think it took me about one month, one and a half month to really craft my cover letter and the email that you attach the cover letter to. And in the very short form, if I want to say the basics of it, you, your cover letter has three paragraphs. The first paragraph is about you. Of, of course, the first one is about what position you're applying for and why you're interested in that. And then you focus on you, your accomplishments as a PhD student. The second paragraph focuses on the PI, the lab you're applying for, what exactly about the researchers of interest. And then the third paragraph which is shorter, is about you and I together, what the future looks like. You can say, I'm interested in such and such projects and very loosely formulated. If you are very strict about what you're formulating, say, I'm coming to the lab exactly to do this, the PI might not be interested in that. So you very much like just loosely put it as an option. And then generally the email is similar as basically the very short form of your cover letter in very condensed form, just like few sentences where you show the paragraphs that I mentioned. Yes, the most of the thing already covered. So I'd say that don't be afraid to reach out to the people. Like sometimes we feel that he's a professor. So what are you going to talk about? So please reach out. Feel free to reach out to the people, either through LinkedIn or in the conferences, because great communication always opens up a door. So if the person knows or had even a short conversation, like whenever he or she reads your name on the email, he or she might recall that conversation and you might get a chance to like have your application reviews. Yeah, always reach out. Lovely. I've learned so much. I had my own postdoc, but it's on, it's in education, so it's not anywhere near what you guys are doing. <laughs> and I just, I even learned a lot about what you guys are going through and Thank you so much for your time. We have some questions. So Serene asks, how many pages was your resume and CV when you applied? You don't have long, short. I would say as short as possible. I think mine was two or three pages. If you are in a discipline like comp computational biology or tissue engineering, they publish a lot. Publications would be just one page. Right. So it really depends on the number of publications you have had, the talks you have had, but generally for each of these accomplishments or that what highlights your scientific output, you try to fit it in one or two lines. And then it just depends on your discipline. 
Yes, people all, no one wants to go through like a five page or six page long resume of the CV. So it's always short as much as it's very tight, it's always preferred. And also one might not list all the publication. So like someone, someone can choose like the most relevant one to paint in the resume. So yeah. Oh yeah. Providing the most relevant information on the resume is great compared to just fluff or anything of the sort. And then our next one is, are there any specific skills you need to learn during your postdoc, which you wish you would have learned during your PhD? Being in a chemistry PhD program, it wasn't always expected or encouraged to do any sort of programming language. But now that I'm in the national labs, uh, every single lab uses Python or programming language of your choice for data analysis and visualization. Yeah, it's the same. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, 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 babe, go ahead. So I just wanted to say the same thing that I feel all of the fields are going towards like generating larger data sets and having some sort of data science background or machine learning background is really beneficial. And I feel if I go back, I would take courses that are relevant to the topic. And that would be especially nice because of an experimentalist, if you understand the language of ML, then it is, it really opens doors in order to be able to take your research to the next level. Yeah, I, I agree with both of you that since it's the era of machine learning, so all of us have to have that knowledge come handy. One thing that I would like to mention is that it's writing. So it's not just writing for get your manuscript submitted, but also writing for fellowship application. So for the international student, the options are sounds very limited, but still there are fellowship available for the grad student level. Just to have that experience helps to get accustomed to write a proposal, which I really feel I should have put more focus on applying for a fellowship, even if I, someone does not get, but at least the experience comes really handy. Thank you. And our next question is, how many months in advance of your PhD graduation did you start applying to postdocs? For me, it was maybe six months. The national labs take a decent amount of time to get the ball rolling, but I think it depends on your lab and what your PI expects out of you. For mine, it was very, he's not going to tell you when you're done. You're done when you're done and you drive yourself the door. And I would imagine other labs are the same and your PI will understand you're ready to go when you take the initiative and say, I'm on my way out. Yes, the same year. I applied about six months um, before I started, and I totally aligned with what Hannah mentioned. It's, it really depends on the lab. We have had postdocs who applied a year in advance, and postdocs who applied only a couple of months in advance. So sometimes, suddenly, a funding comes through, and the PI wants somebody to join the lab immediately, so they are going to hire somebody for the next one or two months. So there's a range of basically timelines. So it's just applying the when you can and just communicate with the PI. Yeah, I would agree that six to eight months is a kind of like reasonable range. But that's like when you started doing the actively applying for the post. But before that, you have to shortlist the lab and like shortlist the PI. So that's start beforehand. So I'd say like more than a year. Because in the six month period, you also have to like manage time for writing your thesis and also going now everything is online, but sometimes you have to like go to the lab and give the presentation. So you have to like keep that in time frame in mind. So six to eight months and be on the timeline. That makes sense. That makes sense. So yeah, for us here at the Dr. Rolex Design Studio, we do recommend that same, basically that same time frame. Let's start thinking about this. If anything, I want you all to start thinking about your postdoc in your third or fourth year. Let's start figuring that out. And with our help, we can go from there. So we have a great next question. It is, what are your opinions about doing multiple postdocs before searching for an academic job? I mean, it's very much dependent on the scene. For example, I know about the astrophysics. They need to do multiple postdocs. But for engineering, 
like one or two year, one poster could be sufficient. So it's very much dependent on the field. For example, like someone doing experimental, anything like the biology or uh, chemistry. So the postdoc becomes anyway long because they had to do biology for like synthetic biology. So I don't think people will have time for doing multiple postdocs in that situation. And the main reason of doing the postdoc is like getting acquainted with a, a new field and getting paper published, good journal, or getting citation. So if one postdoc is already like fulfilling all these criteria, then why go for a multiple? But it definitely depends on the field because I know one of my friends from physics department, he has to go for a second postdoc because that's like a norm in that field. But otherwise, because why stay in a position of lower uh, salary and less responsibility? A hundred percent agree. Hannah or Shiva, any thoughts? I just wanted to say, I think it's pretty standard for a lot of PhD students to graduate and then stay in the PhD lab for a couple of months before moving on to actually do the postdoc, like the actual postdoc. That's one thing. And then the second thing is, I totally agree with Double Jyoti. The goal of doing a postdoc is to be able to show that you can be successful. You can publish in another field or feel closer to your PhD work. And once you accomplish that, you're ready to launch your career in academia or industry. And as somebody who actually switched postdocs lab, uh, I have to say, it, I switched because ran into COVID. There were funding issues and that we discussed. And then I switched labs and I actually ended up in the RNA world. I never thought I will do RNA biology and I'm really enjoying it. So it has happened to be really an enjoyable experience for me, but if there were no funding issues, it wouldn't be necessary, I would say, something that I had planned. Sorry, can I direct? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I mute myself. So I also have a follow-up <laughs> question, if that question is from me. So if I want to like switch field completely, then maybe I have to do like multiple postdocs. So the question is, um, if you would like to switch the field completely, yeah, would you have yeah. to do multiple postdocs? Yeah, exactly. So sorry, if I just address this, I think that depends on what you consider to be the point of getting a PhD. I feel what I consider the PhD training to be is not necessarily to be the greatest in a certain field. I see the PhD is training to become an independent thinker. And to be able to address a certain problem I'm really interested in addressing for the rest of, let's say, my career. So it, your PhD can be in any field. And then you basically learn how to think, how to tackle a problem, learn some of the tools that you need to have to tackle that problem. And then generally as a postdoc, you can use the, those problem solving tools and apply to an even totally di different field. So if you go with that definition, you don't necessarily need the third platform to show that your second platform worked very well. And generally, a post-site advisor would not get somebody who is totally, totally new where they have to like, spend like months to train you. So if a PI says, yes, please come into my lab and do your post-site work. So most likely you already have a lot of the tools and the problem solving skills that is needed to tackle that problem. So that's how I think about it. Yeah, I completely agree with Shiva that the skill set that actually matters. And when, whether in academia or industry, when someone get evaluated, it will be based on the skill set that the person already has achieved, or learned through PhD or postdoc. It's not exactly how many postdoc that someone is to have been done. Even if it's like a venture to a new field, but I think the skill set that learned from one field can be easily transferred to the other. So it's like the, the ability to transfer one skill set and how to be like, I'd say, be able to apply, apply those tools to the a new problem. I think that matters most. Thank you.
Awesome. Thank you. This is a great question as well. If you could go back and give your give advice to yourself as a first year PhD student, what would you say? Um, I think for me, I would tell myself that it's okay to take the lead. I think in the beginning of my PhD, I was very much looking for direction all of the time and eventually found out that the PI is looking for you to find your own direction. And the sooner that you can take responsibility for your work, the quicker you can develop into a scientist. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And also the basics are really important. We sometimes start to neglect the basics and try to go for the advanced, but having a strong basics always makes it easier to grasp like a new information. And other thing is that, so it's placed in our head that if something is being said by a senior grad student or a postdoc might be the right one, whether might be like my instinct of saying something different. So try to communicate your views without having the thought that the other person who might be have like the more experience gonna work. So it's always try to speak up your mouth. Yeah, totally agree. I don't have much to add. Thank you. Next question. Well, we have some great, some questions. We know publication is super important for a postdoc application. And I think we touched on this in our conversation earlier, but I want to circle back to it a little. Do you have any suggestions to students from fields that are not easy to have their work published before a postdoc application? It very much depends on the, the domain again. But thing is that, for example, like in neuroscience or in synthetic biology, it takes a really long time to publish a paper and the PI, which applying for the postdoc, he or she already aware of that. So it's nothing to worry about. You, you can tell what you are working on, what is the work status. And I'm sure that uh, you have enough skill or enough knowledge to convince him or her that it will be like a, a really great addition to his or her lab. So it's not always need to have already published article. Sometimes it takes time. We will understand that. And also sometimes you might not have the research results already in form of a publication that you can package, but there might be some patents you have filed. There might be some conference presentations that are a poster presentation or a talk that you had. So you could highlight those in your cover letter that the manuscript is under preparation, but I've gone here and there and we can give a flavor of what you have already accomplished. I agree with the other two and just make it a conversation and talk about where you've been and why you're at where you're at in your publication process. And people in your field will understand. As a synthetic chemist, during my first two years, I spent trying to make a panel of conjugates that uh, we later found out fall apart as soon as they're made. And with these kind of conversations, people will understand. Next up is... I've been exploring postdoc opportunities, but I'm finding it difficult to find a perfect match for my dream research topic. How far should I be willing to diverge from my current focus to make the most of opportunities available? And is there a balance between pursuing what I'm passionate about and being flexible with broader or related fields? I think it depends how far from your kind of dream path that uh, you're thinking of going, because it's always good to bring new ideas to the lab. And if it's close enough, there will always you know, be opportunities to build off of research that's going on there. I think it just depends on you know, how far away from your dream research you're looking. And I have to also say, put yourself in the PI position, the PI whose lab you're applying for. Because if you come in, like you, you don't have necessarily the knowledge of the field or any technique that is related to the field or the research problem they're addressing completely brand new and it's totally different from your domain, then the PI might say you basically have to spend months getting trained as opposed to a postdoc they can hire and have things started the first day. So I would say compromise. If the, somebody told me once you're applying for a postdoc, that was a very good advice that either to tackle a different research problem with the tools you learned during the PhD, 
try to get the techniques you have or, or go address the same research problem with a different set of techniques or basically moving totally to a different model organism and try to keep the technique and the research uh, question you have. So you need to find a common denominator with the a prospective postdoc lab and say, this is what I have that can be of use to you. And these are all the things that I want to learn from you. So definitely we should compromise, especially if that group is your dream group. You need to find a middle ground compromise to see where you can fit yourself. Yeah, I totally agree. So the flexibility is always a good thing. You might not know that whether you're going to, because you haven't the research in that field. So you might end up liking that. So who knows? And lastly, any tips for preparing for postdoc interviews? Anytime I have an interview, I try and read the literature that the lab has published. So at least you can speak their language during the interview. Yeah, that's, I think, the most important advice that one can give. And they keep your basic very clear. And like, it should be very, you should be very ready to communicate your research in the world of a layman in some sense because the PI might obviously is knowledgeable he or she might not have done the research in your field so to communicate clearly so that uh, he or she can understand the even the nuances of your research is very important the clear communication and what Hannah mentioned that be familiar with the the terminology because the terminology they differ from domain to domain so just be aware so that you can explain your research in their words. And also the interview process is not only about the lab being interested in us as an applicant, it's also about basically you. I would say like in that lab, so definitely try to probe us questions about the mentoring the style of the PI, just like the overall culture of the lab, how much they, how big the lab is, how much they spend time together socializing if that's something that is of you know importance to you so just definitely see whether the lab is a good culture fit for you and you have to also assess the lab once you're being interviewed it's not only a one-way street yeah it's very important it's not like the the pi is interviewing you but you will be also interviewing pi so you can also like feel free to suggest new ideas that you think might be befitting um, to the PI's research direction. So, yeah. Awesome. It looks like if we have any other questions, just put them into the chat. But it looks like we are pretty much done here. We, I appreciate I learned so much. And hopefully everyone in here has gotten a little bit of something out of this. Uh, I know that we have three great experts here. And they shared all of their experience, all most of their experiences of being in a postdoc. Can y'all tell me where they can connect with you if possible? Like LinkedIn or something? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, so yeah. LinkedIn, yes. LinkedIn? LinkedIn. And, um, yeah, it's the best platform to reach out nowadays, so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yep. So if there isn't any other questions, I will give y'all's time back. And I appreciate everything. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And there will be a survey. So please help me out with filling out the survey and we'll go, we'll catch you in the next event. Yeah. And thank you so much for having us today. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Yeah. Bye.